And what I always tell families is it's, it's as if a child who's been in multiple placements and who was adopted is walking around with a puzzle above their heads. It's like an imaginary puzzle. And some of the puzzle pieces have faces on it so they can go together. And there's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of not knowing. And these kids are walking around with so many questions and so much confusion and they're overwhelmed with all of this stuff that they're carrying with them. So a lot of these interventions really help the child look at them, look at what the core issues are and externalize them so they don't have to carry them. So they have a container and a place to project it because that was a big piece of it. I was holding all of this anxiety and I had nowhere to put it. Welcome. Come on in. Have a seat. Um, so we're working on anger today. We're working on grief and loss. We're working on these questions. We're working on containment, helping a child feel loved and helping a child understand their story so that they can have a narrative. Because one of the big pieces in, for these kids is they don't understand their narrative, which is their histories. So there's so much confusion. We have to, do, we have to be direct and do the mapping for them. And as you can see, I'm going to show you how I do family trees with children who've been in multiple placements so they can see it and have some objectivity. This is where I've been in my life. I don't have to carry it all by myself. And for families, I always do, the parent is always in the session. So it's really important, you know, seeing a child alone, the parent needs to be, the foster parent, the potential adoptive parent needs to be in the session with that child doing the work. Because what I'm teaching is the parent to be a therapeutic parent. So that they don't need me as a therapist, as the interventionist. They can do it on their own. And they have the tools. And the other thing is they have the capacity to teach their children coping skills. Because really, I was doing a training for Children's Bureau. And one of the things that came up in discussion about being an adopted person is... We say, oh, are you adopted? And it's as if that's a condition. Oh, you're adopted. They're not adopted now. It's not that they're a condition. It means that they were adopted. That was an event in their life. That was an event of an adoption. So what the condition is, is what I've been thinking about, is the management of this lifelong process of managing these emotions these psychological feelings and thoughts and helping these kids build coping skills because boy, do they need it. I mean, I'm an adult adoptee. I am still working on building coping skills. At every new stage of development, we are going to experience a new understanding of our stories, a new understanding of our loss, and we're going to make a new sense of it. We're going to have new thoughts, new feelings. And that's integration. And that's what we want to do. Help these kids. If you know some, something about the brain, the right brain is the feeling brain, the limbic system. It's irrational. Then we've got the left brain, which is logic. It's all rational. These kids are living in their limbic brains because they have low thresholds for stress because of the post-traumatic stress they've endured. They don't know how to cope. And they tend to go in that fight, flight, freeze mode. They act it out. They have no other choice. So what we want to do is help them make sense of it so they can integrate their feelings into their thinking brain and go, I can think about this. It's not so scary. I can handle it. But it's our job to model that for them. And I'm going to show you how I do that. And you'll see I'm very passionate about this stuff. Um, it means a lot to me. And... Uh, I want it to mean a lot to you because when a child really recognizes that you care, it means the world to them because they feel like, does someone really understand and do I really exist and do I really matter? Because there's a lot of low self-esteem. So as you can see, I'm animated. I 
One of the most important things is our nonverbal communication. 90% of our communication is nonverbal. Okay? Really important to understand that. So I try to keep an open face with these kids because their perception, when we, if they're going to, we want to be a safe caretaker to them, a safe person to them. If they perceive that we're a threat, they're going to go in that defensive mode. So we want to be open with them and show them that we're open. And one of the attitudes I use is always be curious. Even if it's something that's very big and overwhelming or hard to tolerate, be curious. And when you have an attitude of curiosity, your whole face opens up and you're more open. And a child will, will feel that with you. Um, so being curious is really, really important. And just watching your movements, because kids who've had physical abuse, any fast movement could just trigger an early memory of being abused. So I worked with a family where the parent said he just reached up to grab a cup out of the cupboard, and the child flinched. And the child thought that the parent was going to hit him, because that was his early memory with his birth family. When I see this, I get hit. So we want to be really careful and aware of our nonverbal movements and understanding and taking into consideration that child's history. Um, so also, these interventions, you're going to use at your discretion. You know, I really think about each kid individually. Not all of these interventions are going to work for every child. You're going to pick and choose and there's a lot of pieces to these interventions. So you're going to pick little pieces that work and you're going to see what works and do more of it. If it doesn't work, that's okay. They may not be ready. Uh, it may be too overwhelming for them to go deeper into their histories and work on their emotions because it's scary and it's totally understandable. So we want to follow their lead. Don't feel like, oh, Jeanette said do this. Let's, we need to do this. Well, always follow the child's lead. If there's resistance, that means they're overwhelmed. We want to respect their resistance as fear. They're scared. We don't want to induce more fear. Uh, that could cause secondary trauma because then they're feeling helpless and we're instilling more post-traumatic stress. We don't want to do that. We want to have fun. And you'll see with these interventions, I have a lot of fun. And I've, I, the model that I use is if, if I don't feel good, they're not going to feel good about this. So you have to really believe in these interventions too uh, because they do work. I've seen, I've had responses, and you can always email me from families, therapists, social workers. I did the shadow world, and it was fantastic. The kid was really telling me about their story and sharing. That's what we want. We want them to be able to feel safe enough to express and get it out because what's shareable is bearable. And that's what we want these kids to learn. You can bear it. It's, you're going to get through this and it's going to be okay. Is it painful? Yes, but you're not alone. You're with someone who's safe, who understands, who tolerates, and who's helping you make sense of this.